Hey, Kit, you excited to go see some geology today? Yeah? All right, we'll go. Kit and I are leaving the um, Days Inn in uh, Banning, California. We're heading about an hour and a half south of here to the um, Salton Sea, which is like an hour south of um, Palm Springs. It is like uh, 150, 60 miles from the border and it's a cool, weird feature and we're gonna try to answer today's question, which is, why is the Salton Sea there? All right, so uh, it's kind of windy, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, that right there is the second highest peak in the continent of the U.S., San Gregorio. Um, we had seen the first highest in the last video series I did with the, the Sierras with Mount Whitney. So we've got the second highest here, and then we go across the valley floor, and it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a peak right there that has some snow on it, and that's San Jacinto, which is the third highest. Okay, 
Okay, so I'm gonna actually do the third video here because I'm stopped at a gas station, which by the way, a AM PM has crunchy ice. I have never been this excited to be at a gas station before. <laughs> That's not like sponsored. I just really love crunchy ice. Okay, so the third kind of plate boundary is something called a trans uh, transverse fault. That's when two plates, I'm gonna actually use my hands here. So pretend we're looking at an overhead view. Two plates are moving in opposite directions, grinding against each other. So parallel but opposite movements. So um, in this case, pretend this is the North American, uh, sorry, pretend this is the Pacific plate. This is my North American plate. Pacific plate is moving in a Northwestern direction. The North American plate is moving in a Southeastern direction. They are grinding against each other. This has been happening for uh, about 28 million years. Um, What's tricky though is that we're actually at the southern end of the San Andreas Fault at this point. So this is the entire stretch of the San Andreas Fault is doing this at a plate boundary. But down at the southern end, they're actually also starting to become a divergent plate boundary as well. So they are moving not just in parallel directions, but they're actually starting to move and pull away from each other, which if you've been like grinding against the same plate for 28 million years, I guess you would probably want a little bit of space too. Um, so we are actually with the Salton Sea going to be down in this divergent split area a little further south about 160 miles that's where we have uh, Baja California which is actually a full-on what's called a spreading center spreading center is where you fill in like I was saying how you have those divergent plates and it fills in the magma there that's what's happening a little further south we're at the northern end of that so we're just in this transitional zone where it's moving from being split apart to being just this sort of locked grinding motion. So that's what we're gonna go see today. Um, okay, so one more thing that we have to talk about before I can hit the road again, because Kit's really, really bored. He's fallen asleep on my notebook, so that's great. Um, in the early stages of a plate splitting apart, uh, something called a rift valley forms. So a uh, rift valley, both the Red Sea and the uh, East African rift valley are good examples of it. Um, but there's one that is less than 200 miles from here, which would be Baja, California. It's a rift zone that's about a little less than 6 million years old. Um, so one of the things that you might be wondering, because you're smart and listening to me and paying attention, is why are rift valleys filled in with water? Uh, Red Sea, Baja, California, why are two of those filled in with water? And that's because um, when it splits apart, it a, creates a low point and the nearest body of water rushes in. Um, that would be happening here in the Salton Trough and up through, like the Baja California would actually be extending further north, if not for the Colorado River, which that's a whole thing I'll get into in a second. Um, and I should mention, I keep using the phrases Salton Trough and Salton Sea interchangeably because I'm not a professional and even though words mean something, I don't bother to pay attention to what I'm saying at any given time but um, technically it is called the Salton Trough is the area we're talking about the lake itself is the Salton Sea but the whole area that we're dealing with is the Salton Trough so the Salton Trough is an example of a feature called a graben which is um, literally it's German for grave uh, because geologists are super metal so they picked grave as a way to describe a feature using the most metal of languages. Um, I'm going to use my iPad case here to uh, show how this actually happens. So basically you've got land here and then you've got the folds this and this where the where it normally folds up to create a little tent thing. We're gonna pretend those are faults um, and so what happens is that the faults become active and it down drops this center area. So you have a mountain on this side, you have a mountain on this side, and then you've got this deep valley feature in between, this long deep valley feature that runs the length of those faults. Um, you can see that in Death Valley is a really good example of it all through that area. Uh, I had mentioned if you watched the Sierra Nevada video, I talked about how it's not a coincidence that um, Mount Whitney is the highest point and Death Valley is the lowest point you have a graben feature over there because of all the faulting. So Salton Sea is below sea level and um, it should actually be flooded completely with the Pacific Ocean stretching up through Baja California, from Baja California up northward. But about five million years ago, the Colorado River um, kind of naturally rerouted itself 
and it started depositing sediments. And as it deposited those sediments, it actually naturally dammed up the bottom of the Baja California area. So if not for that natural damming motion m movement, we would have had, um, we would have a full on, the, the Baja California would stretch much further north. So that's everything that I think I need to cover before we start hitting our actual like destinations for the day. What we've talked about already is the recent history of the Salton Sea, but what we haven't talked about is the prehistoric formation of the lake that preceded it. So there was, um, starting in, like the, in the Pleistocene, so around three million years ago, the Salton Trough, that down-dropped area, would fill periodically because of the uh, routing of the uh, Colorado River, it would fill periodically with a lake. Um, it's collectively known as Ancient Lake Cahuilla. Uh, Cahuilla is the na name of a uh, native tribe that lived in the area. Oh, I hope I find the stop sign. <laughs> I might turn around. Anyway, so Ancient Lake Cahuilla, and that would fill periodically. Uh, so much of the land that we're on is actually ancient lake bed. Um, and what I'm hoping to find is, I don't think I'm going to find it. I think I am not lost necessarily, but not, not in the right place. Okay. Yeah, it's no trespassing sign. So I'm going to include this in the video because, um, this is, uh, this is just an example of how it's not perfect. Oh, but look at what a beautiful view we have of the Salton Sea. Look at that. Okay, um, so I'm on the right road now. Figured it out. Uh, generally speaking, when I find out that I'm not in the right place, it's because I'm not good at reading directions, not because the directions were wrong. So, um, let's see, I'm gonna just, well, I'm on a dirt road, so I'm gonna do this. So, just to show you how flat this all is, except for in the distance. This flat territory, when you see land this flat, it, go back in there, it generally means that you are on a lake or seabed uh, because it's being deposited in a very even fashion. Um, as we have like slight rolling hills, something like this, this is actually the, um, what would have been the edge of the seabed or of, the, of one of the lake stands um, in the, the guide I read it was about 14,000 years ago. Yep. So this is an incised, like a bank that was incised onto the seabed. Um, so yeah, when you have something this flat, you just, you look around and you think it was probably deposited in a water environment. Now what I've got off to the right is uh, the other reason I'm driving out here right now, which is that is uh, oh, don't want to hit the butterflies. Uh, that is an oasis, a, a, an oasis uh, with palm trees and stuff. This is dorky. Here we are at Dos Palmas. Kit, get back on the trail, please. Good boy. Here we are at Dos Palmas, and we are here because San Andreas Trail. So, uh, the San Andreas Fault, it has been, it runs the length of it runs the length of uh, basically the 10 and then the 110 as from the San Gorgonio down. So we're on, or the 111, sorry, the 111 highway. And uh, there are these palm oases all along this stretch. And that's happening because what's basically occurring as, um, as you, as the two plates grind against each other is they are grinding up the, um, the rock at the fault line. And it creates this very, very, very fine, very dense sediment called fault gouge. So what ends up happening with fault gouge is, uh, let's see, check in on Kit. As you have this fault gouge, it actually creates a barrier to the groundwater. So the fault gouge, let's say this is the fault, and on this side here, um, the water is running toward it, but it hits this fault gouge and it can't go anywhere, so it wells upward. As it wells upward, it creates this very linear, which you can see here the Dos Palmas uh, oasis is a very linear uh, oasis where the water crops up basically along the fault trace of the San Andreas. Hey bud, 
Yeah, you, you've got so many smells here, I know. Um, made it to the oasis, and you can see just how linear it is. Um, how these palms just basically all cluster together and then stop. They don't extend any further. This isn't man-made. This is a naturally occurring feature. Um, and then it stretches back that way in a similar linear manner. Um, and what you're really seeing is something that hints at the underlying geology that isn't visible to the eye. So that's just one of those weird, neat things about um, geology. Um, so off in the distance, that over there, those are um, the Bat, bat Cave Buttes, um, which are sandstone. And they are actually, they were um, during the last high stand of one of the ancient, of ancient Lake uh, Kauia, they actually kind of jutted out like little islands. Um, the San Andreas Fault actually runs basically along the base of it. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. You can see there how the layers of sandstone are angled, how it's all kind of uplifted a little bit. And that's, you can, as you look further over, you can see more of that. So the San Andreas Fault is actually running along the base right there. Um, I'm very close to train tracks right now. Running along the base of those uh, foothills over there. So that's what really defines a huge amount of this side of the Salton Sea um, and the, the eastern end of the Salton Trough. The San Andreas Fault Zone is actually, as they've done studies through this area, they believe that it's actually much wider and that there's some deformation they weren't anticipating all through here. So the fault starts to do some interesting stuff in this area. So along the mountains, like along the base of the mountains over there, you can see that it's greener. Um, contrast that with this side over here where it's very sparsely vegetated. And the reason for that is along the base of the mountains, you've got, that's the North American plate side, and then you're on the Pacific plate here. The water runoff comes off of the mountains, and then it meets again that um, fault gouge, the, the ground up, uh, the ground up um, plate. And what happens is it ends up blocking the water table so it can't go further. So you have all this green vegetation on one side of the plate and then desert on the other. Um, one other thing that's kind of cool about the uh, depositions in this area, I'm not gonna get out and show you mostly because there's nowhere that I feel really safe pulling over and parking. Um, but on the left-hand side, there are all these little washes, these little creeks, and um, they actually expose a layer of what's called Bishop Tuff, T-U-F-F, -F, Tuff. And that's basically an ash layer, a deposit of ash. So that's important because um, Bishop Tuff was from a volcanic eruption about 748,000 years ago in Long Valley, which is north of where I was for the Sierra video. Um, it's very far from here and it was deposited all the way down south here, uh, hundreds of miles, in a massive eruption. And that serves two purposes for us. One, shows just the extent of the eruption and the ash fall, can show just how catastrophic an eruption like that can be. But two, volcanic ash, um, it can be dated. It's used as a, it's, it's a um, depositional marker that can let us know what, how old the rock below is and how old the rock above is because you assume that the ash is deposited on an existing layer of rock so you know that anything below it has to be older than the eruption. Likewise, you assume that anything above it has to be younger. So since the Bishop Tuff has such a widespread depositional area, you can use it as a marker not just here in the Salton Sea or Salton Trough, but you can actually use that across the whole state of California and stretching outward to kind of create a baseline of what's been ha what was happening at that time and to be able to uh, earmark and figure out what's going on geologically throughout the region. Um, I'm hoping it's this is what's coming up ahead. There is something weird started happening uh, a couple years ago, or maybe it was this year, with a mud pot. So we're gonna talk a little more about mud pots later, but mud pot is basically when um, super, or not superheated, but hot water that's been heated by the mantle and the lower crust 
moves upward through the um, through the earth and upwells into this like little kind of mud volcano. Um, really good examples are at Yellowstone. You see those mud pots all over Yellowstone. And, and like a year ago, this mud pot over here started migrating. And um, it started moving and no one knows why. So I don't know, I'm just gonna pull over. Um, so I think it's over, I'm pulling over so I can kind of point, but I think it's over here. And what would happen was it moved like a hundred feet. It moved a lot and scientists don't know why. And it's actually now threatening the integrity of the train lines. So they had to create a second train line, um, to reroute it because they, it was undermining the train. There's nothing they could do. Now, you're probably wondering, why don't they know what's happening? And that's for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of geology that's happening through here, a lot of fault lines that we can't see that are related to the San Andreas Fault. But more importantly, stuff happens sometimes with the Earth and we don't know why. And when that happens, it's the jo job of a geologist to request a research grant to get it. The problem is there isn't a ton of research grants going around uh, to get enough money to study it. And uh, so, there's other priorities at the moment. And um, this is probably something that I would guess the train rail, the Pacific Union or whoever owns these train tracks, I never pay attention to that. They'll probably invest in that at some point. But for right now, we just have this weird wandering mud pot. Right, I'm not normally super into um, birds, but this is really cool. So we're near the Sunny Bono, uh, Bono Nature uh, Wildlife Sanctuary or Refuge whatever it's called, um, and it's a huge bird refuge. So you've got all of these, I don't know, sea water birds hanging out here. There are also all these clouds of them flying around too, but I couldn't get a good view of that. Um, I'm gonna bother Nico Gonzalez and ask him what they are. Let's see if I can zoom in so we can get a better view. These are the uh, Davis Shrimp or Shrimp Davis mud volcanoes. Uh, they're on private property and I am a law-abiding citizen but also a wuss so I'm not gonna hike out to them. Um, and that is a geothermal energy plant. These two things are right next to each other because remember I was talking about um, the idea that the southern part of the San Andreas Fault is splitting apart. In this area the crust is thin so the hot upper mantle is a lot closer to the surface than it is in other areas in most other parts of the, con of the continent, in most other parts of the plate. Because you've got this heat fairly shallow, um, I think like 12 miles below the surface, what happens is water within the crust is heated and it moves upward. As it moves upward, it picks up other min minerals along the way, uh, dissolves other minerals and starts to, and it bubbles upward creating these mud volcanoes. Um, the geothermal energy plants are all through here. You can see they, there's this one here and there's some behind me as well. Um, and they do provide a fair amount of energy to this southern, this southern area. Um, yeah, that's about all I gotta say about that. Hey look, something wild was here. Um, all right, I am at an abandoned dry ice facility. They used to actually pull um, carbon dioxide out of the uh, wells and then would turn it into dry ice. It smells terrible here. Um, that's because... So carbon dioxide would well up because that super hot water would uh, filter up through layers of calcium rich deposition. So layers of rock that had a lot of like shellfish uh, fossils, things that have a uh, calcium exoskeleton creating a, a layer of sediment the water would filter up through it pick up that carbon and then it would exit up th it would then come up as a gas carbon dioxide so you could mine it um, it's now my new murder house so this is where I will be doing all of my murders um, and it smells terrible because there's other gases as well that get upwelled here um, that 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 erupt out here uh, ammonium and sulfates and things that I don't know about. Hello Kit. We're at Red Hill. Um, it is 
a uh, extrusive uh, volcanic outcrop. So what this is is this is um, rhyolite. Rhyolite is one of I had talked about this before that rhyolite is one of the three different kind of levels of um, types of extrusive volcanic rock. So basically of lava that forms. Um, what's cool with this is you can see right here that there are within the rhyolite you also have other clasts or rocks. Um, there's a really big one over there that it is capturing and flowing and pulling along. So these are either um, in some cases like this shiny thing right here that there we go that is obsidian in other cases you've got um, ash material that's been trapped that's can uh, form something solid and then trapped and moved or maybe you have chunks of uh, basement rock as well I'm gonna get a nice chunk of obsidian right here yeah, let's see if I can get it there we go um, this is obsidian that is distinctive to this, that is a hallmark of this area. Um, so shiny glass surface, but then you've got right here, um, these are large like uh, feldspars inside of it. So you've got other rocks and minerals within it, but that, that bright glassy surface. Um, and then further out, we have the other ones. There's I think five of these little domed uh, outcroppings. And over further out that way, I think is Mullet Island, which I'm trying to get to, but we'll see if I can manage to do it. Um, a couple of features that I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about the age, um, mostly because it's a widely contested thing still. Um, the obsidian, there are all the different uh, volcanic domes. There's a pretty wide age range that they're still trying to settle on from what I've read. Um, sometime between 16,000 and 2,000 years ago, but yeah. I, I haven't been able to find anything definitive on that. Um, and then there was also within the, um, I, didn't, I didn't get a good view of anything that I could show you, uh, or I don't know what to be looking for, but there are um, wave cut marks on the butte, on Red Hill as well, where you can kind of see where the, um, if, like I said, it would have been an island, and you can see where the water mark, the high water mark would have been on the island. This is actually something kind of cool. The uh, scientists thought that the volcanoes were much older than they actually were, that the volcanic activity was much older than it was. Um, and evidence, they found evidence that it erupted most recent, that it erupted down here most recently about 2,000 years ago. Uh, which one means that the USGS actually has to f consider this an active geol geologic hazard. Um, it's an active volcanic hazard listed on the USGS website. Um, but two, the other thing that's cool about that is it explains why there were certain tools. I'm actually going to do this really fast so you can see a little better off to the side there. That's where I, uh, let's see, that's where I just was, that little red mound there. That's Red Hill. Um, the fact that the volcano was erupting about 2,000 years ago explains why some of the why they weren't finding in um, archaeological records obsidian tools from that flow used prior to like 2,000 years ago so it's one of those times when archaeology and geology kind of inform each other uh, which happens quite a bit down here I haven't gotten too much into that um, because to be honest it's not something I'm super strong on and so I don't even know how to begin to research it. Um, but there are petroglyphs dating back to about 10,000 years ago. This is an area that has had active settlement for a very long time. Uh, and the humans in this area have interacted with the geology in a very active way. Uh, I should have covered this a lot earlier, but everything got kind of thrown off when I couldn't get to the San Andreas Fault. And then I got distracted by shiny objects. Um, but. The salt, the re, a big part of why visiting, oh, that was where I was supposed to turn. A big part of why um, visiting the Salton Trough was a uh, like a main priority for me, in addition to being kind of a small, easy to do day trip for this kind of test second video, was because um, the geologists ex believe that the, the next rupture for the San Andreas Fault is going to happen starting down here. Um, and then it will rupture northward. 
essentially the reason they think that is because this this section of the San Andreas Fault hasn't ruptured since 1600 or sorry 1680 ish, um, and normally it has a reoccurrence rate. So normally it, it, an earthquake occurs every 200, 150 to 200 years. We're well past that at this point. Um, it, so 1680 to 2019, that's quite a bit of time. Uh, they expect that that will be the next location. We are a couple hours south of LA. There will be about a minute of lag time between when the earthquake starts and when the first seismic waves hit Los Angeles. So we'll have about a minute of warning, which is why it's very important to download the new app that was released by the city of Los Angeles um, that will notify you if there is an earthquake. It's really intended specifically for this section of the San Andreas Fault rupture. Uh, I should have covered this a lot earlier, but everything got kind of thrown off when I couldn't get to the San Andreas Fault, and then I got distracted by shiny objects. Um, but the salt, the re a big part of why visiting, oh, that was where I was supposed to turn. A big part of why um, visiting the Salton Trough was a uh, like a main priority for me, in addition to being kind of a small, easy to do day trip for this kind of test second video, was because. Um, the geologists ex believe that the, sa the next rupture for the San Andreas Fault is going to happen starting down here, um, and then it will rupture northward. Essentially, the reason they think that is because this, this section of the San Andreas Fault hasn't ruptured since 1600, or sorry, 1680-ish, um, and it, normally it has a reoccurrence rate. So normally it, it, an earthquake occurs every 200, 150 to 200 years. We're well past that at this point. Um, it, so 1680 to 2019, that's quite a bit of time. Uh, they expect that that will be the next location. We are a couple hours south of LA. There will be about a minute of lag time between when the earthquake starts and when the first seismic waves hit Los Angeles. So we'll have about a minute of warning, which is why it's very important to download the new app that was released by the city of Los Angeles um, that will notify you if there is an earthquake. It's really intended specifically for this section of the San Andreas Fault rupture. Okay, this is cool. I have never seen anything quite like this. Um, I don't know if this is something that people see in other parts of the country normally. <laughs> go around me. Just go around me. There's something cool happening. Um, that's really cool. Look at all those birds. Okay, I will begrudgingly admit that birds are kind of cool. I'm at the uh, southern end of the Salton Sea, so to the left, heading southward, is the Brawley Fault Zone, which is sort of what the San Andreas Fault transitions into. Beyond that is then Baja California, where it then begins to spread apart. You've got that new plate creation happening. So all through here is very, very thin crust with upwellings of magma very close to the surface, giving us uh, geothermal and hydrothermal power. The Salton Sea itself is about 200 and, uh, no, 343 square miles. Um, contrast that with the ancient lakes, Lake Cahuillas that would be here through here periodically. That would be about 220,000, uh, 220, sorry, that would be about 2,200 square miles. So a difference of Salton Sea, which is pretty big, um, looks pretty big to the eye, and again, 300 miles, square miles, versus Ancient Lake Cahuillas being about 2,200 square miles, which is why you have all, again, this very flat land. All right, uh, it's very unlikely that I'm gonna get to my last stop, which would have been um, this rock called Travertine Rock, um, which has basically calcium deposits on it from lake algae that would show the high stand, the high points of uh, ancient Lake Cahuilla, just to show kind of the scale and the depth of it. But I am stuck in a big backup and the sun's setting behind the mountains, so I'm not optimistic about getting there. So just know that that would have been a thing we would have seen um, to give you kind of a sense of that depth and scale because my three main goals for the day 
were to talk about the San Andreas Fault as it runs through this last southern portion of it, of the, the last southern portion of the San Andreas Fault, uh, especially because, like I said, it will be the next site of the rupture, most likely, along the San Andreas Fault. Second goal was to talk about the volcanics in the area, to talk about the uh, mud pots. Talked, I didn't really touch on the fact that there's vents as well, did I? I don't remember. Anyway, the mud pots, the geothermal uh, vents, the fact that there is geothermal energy being um, harnessed here to power as a power plant. Um, and that's a direct result of the fact that the crust is thin here because it is the transition into a spreading center. And then my third goal was to talk a little bit about ancient Lake Kuia, which was that ongoing cycle of filling and then draining within this area that created large um, freshwater lakes as runoff from the Colorado. So we tackled most of that and uh, hopefully going forward if you find yourself down at the Salton Sea you at least kind of know why it's here and it is the way it is. All right thanks to those of you guys who watched appreciate it. Um, if you have any friends who are into this sort of thing share it give me feedback anything helps um, just in terms of like hearing whether or not this is worth continuing. All right thanks guys.